this molecule might just be the most important tool in our fight against cancer. Despite being only a hundred times the size of a single atom, it can act as the earliest alarm system in our cellular machinery, signaling the oncoming to one of the deadliest existential threats our bodies face. Because in the fight against cancer, time matters. Catch it too late and your survival odds might be under 10%, but catch it early and that can jump to over 90%. That explains why this breakthrough might be catching quite so many headlines recently. My Onco can diagnose cancers, including those in the lung, stomach, prostate and ovary. It works by detecting small molecules called microRNAs in the blood. These can indicate cancer. This is a story about one of the most important cancer detection tools we've ever tried to develop, but I'm biased. I played a very small role in helping to grow this company. I've always been fascinated by the concept that one day we could have a single test that not only says if something is wrong, but also where in our body there might be a problem. This is the closest I have ever seen to getting to that idea. So welcome to a new series that I'm calling Breakthrough, where I share more of my actual job and what I get up to when I'm not at the mercy of the YouTube algorithm, where we'll go deep behind the headlines and get inside the minds of people doing things that most of us think are impossible, and see some of the most advanced technologies on the planet. Today you're coming with me to visit Andy, who I first met back in 2024 when he was trying to do something that sounded basically impossible, creating a single blood test capable of detecting multiple cancers earlier than anything else in the world. So if you look at the red, you'll see that this is cancer, and the blue, this is no cancer. I want to understand this approach and why everyone is talking about it. But first, let's start with the easy stuff. How to detect something before there are any signs that it's actually there. But how are we supposed to combine the DNA of two strains of the same species? Actually, Homer. I always find it really hard to come to terms with this, that cancer is one of the most well-known diseases on the planet, yet despite how much we've studied it, it still is one of the hardest to catch in time. You could feel completely fine, experience no symptoms, and still something malignant could be growing within you for years. This is why cancer still claims nearly 10 million lives a year, and why early detection isn't just important, it's everything. For most of medical history, cancer was something we found by accident, or far too late. You'd notice a lump or a pain that wouldn't go away, and by the time it was obvious, it was already dangerous. That's how we started, symptom-based diagnosis, primitive and reactive. Then came imaging, x-rays in the 1890s, CT scans in the 1970s, and MRI in the 1980s. Suddenly, we could see tumors before symptoms appeared, but only if you knew to look for them. And before other symptoms arise, that is rarely the case. In the 20th century, we got smarter, biopsies, blood tests, and pathology. We started measuring more specific things, things, tumor markers like PSA for prostate cancer, CA125 for ovarian. But these signals can be ambiguous and often don't show up strongly until the disease is already advanced. In the last two decades, rather than measuring the side effects of cancer or waiting for tumors to be large enough to see, we started going after the genetic signatures that drive cancer in the first place. That hunt led us to something remarkable. Tiny scraps of DNA shed by tumors, drifting through the bloodstream. We called it circulating tumor DNA, and it was a genuine leap forward. Suddenly, the possibility of a single test that could detect multiple cancers felt like it was almost on the horizon. One of the most advanced, still in clinical trials, is Grail's Gallery Test. From a simple blood sample, this test can detect signals from over 50 types of cancer, and even predict where in the body it originates. But there are still major challenges. Not every mutation we find in circulating DNA actually comes from cancer. The signals can vary wildly between cancers, and right now that is still too expensive and complex to scale for a routine population screening. So most other people that are in this sort of space, they're using methylated DNA or circulating tumor cells. So the issue with those approaches is that methylated DNA is a direct signal from the cancer. So as the cancer gets bigger, you get more of a signal. But at the early stages, you don't get much of a signal, which is why a lot of those approaches suffer at the early stage sensitivity, which is where you actually have a benefit on people's lives. That's where you can save that person. This is the key problem. The moment when detection would save the most lives is exactly when the signal is hardest to find. In fact, in some tests, circulating tumor DNA show early detection sensitivity as low as 16.8%. So that became the challenge. Find something that even when cancer is small, still gives you a large signal. Something basically impossible. We'll cover that, but first I have to thank today's sponsor, Outskill. 
AI is already transforming how we work, and PwC predicts it could add $15 trillion to the global economy by 2030. If you want to stay ahead and be the person using AI rather than being replaced by it, Outskill might be a solution. I've partnered with Outskill, which is the world's biggest AI education platform, to give away a thousand free seats to their two-day AI mastermind course. Already attended by over 4 million people globally, it's happening again this weekend from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 16 hours, 10 powerful tools, and the skills to future-proof your career, where you'll get hands-on with prompt engineering, explore top AI tools like Mate.com and Claude, and build AI agents. By the end of the weekend, you'll be automating your work streams and even creating apps and websites using AI. Normally, this training is almost $900, but if you claim a spot in the next 72 hours, it's completely free. Plus, for you, there's $5,000 in bonuses, including a 3,000 prompt Bible, an AI money roadmap, and your personal AI toolkit. So grab your seat in the link in the description and join the WhatsApp community to stay updated. Thank you to Outskill for supporting the channel. Now, back to the video. Should I abandon hope or fight on bravely against impossible odds? Back in the 1990s, Victor Ambrose and Gary Rovkin were working on the roundworm C. elegans when they made a curious discovery. DNA holds your genetic blueprint, the instructions for building and running your body. Those instructions are called genes, and when expressed are turned into messenger RNA or mRNA, which carries those instructions to the cell's protein-making machinery. These proteins drive most of our biological functions. What Ambrose and Rovkin discovered was a class of RNA orders of magnitude smaller. They called it microRNA. MicroRNA are really small RNAs, they're about sort of 20 bases long. Um, they're important because basically they bind to mRNA, which is uh, used to translate into proteins, and that then has the effect on the cell. But what microRNA does is it binds to that mRNA and regulates its expression. So it can have a big downstream effect. Meaning microRNA play a key role in regulating cell processes like growth, division, and death. And because cancer is a breakdown in these normal cellular processes, that means that cancer cells produce different amounts of these various microRNA. But if we just looked for this signal change, we'd be in the same detection regime as circulating tumor DNA, a weak signal emerging from just a few cells. One of the interesting things about microRNA is because they've been found in extracellular vesicles or exosomes around the body, is there's, there's sort of evidence in the literature that they might be working in a kind of endocrine effect, so they work from one tissue to another tissue. Cells are constantly sending out tiny packages called exosomes, nanosized vesicles filled with different microRNA amongst other biological cargo. Releasing these into their surroundings helps cells communicate with their neighbors. When cells turn cancerous, the mix of microRNA they release changes, along with other signaling molecules like cytokines and growth factors. These altered signals disrupt and reprogram the surrounding healthy cells. As a result, these local cells also alter their microRNA outputs, which in turn affects their own nearby cells, spreading the effect. Some of these microRNA also enter the bloodstream, traveling through the body to tissues like the liver, bone marrow, and blood cells, which respond to these altered signals, and also change their own microRNA outputs in response. What I think is really interesting is that we started this conversation with the idea that the signs of cancer are really difficult to detect. And yet, in a certain light, it seems like the entire body is screaming from every tissue that something is wrong. We just didn't know how to listen. So now that we had a better candidate, we're just left with the big problem. Although microRNA are abundant in comparison to circulating tumor DNA, they are still incredibly hard to detect and exist in low concentrations relative to basically everything else in the blood. To do this detection in a lab setting with equipment, time, and budget is one thing, but Andy had a different vision. We can hopefully make it cheap. We can hopefully make it really scalable and really accessible so it can be implemented with relative ease. So the goal is everyone aged, you know, maybe 50 to 79 gets a test once every year or every two years. And he recognized that his test built on existing microRNA data had incredible potential, but he also saw a major hurdle. The current methods for processing microRNA were too slow, complex, and costly to scale beyond the lab. Keeping this technology confined in the research setting simply wasn't going to cut it. So he did something that an increasing number of scientists are doing in recent years, and he launched a startup based on his breakthrough to build a scalable approach. I've talked about before how I spent most of my PhD working on how to turn tiny, impossible to measure signals into something detectable and reliable. So this idea from Andy really spoke to me. I recently launched a venture capital fund to support scientists just like Andy, because I largely got frustrated when I watched investors around the world backing the 11,000th dating app, but an approach for detecting cancer felt too risky to them. But to be fair, the field had recently been shaken by some kind of bad actors. I'm looking at you, Elizabeth. I knew there were plenty of people eager to support companies like Andy's that also didn't want to end up humiliated after funding the next too-good-to-be-true miracle 
empirical cure. So I started putting my own experience to work and investing in startups grounded firmly in empirical science-backed research. I called it empirical ventures because sometimes branding is hard. I've been working with Andy and his company Xgenera since December as part of their very first round of investment on the simple task of building the most advanced cancer tests in the world to detect changes in microRNA at levels barely detectable in blood in a way that is cheaper and more reliable than any other test on the planet. It seems largely very straightforward. So what's the plan? I gotta finish my science project! To overcome the low signal limit, Andy turned to a technique that you might remember from the COVID-19 pandemic. Quantitative polymerase chain reaction, or you might have heard it called qPCR. It allows us to amplify and quantify even low amounts of specific DNA sequences. Thanks to COVID, qPCR machines are suddenly widely available in hospitals, clinics, and even mobile labs around the world. You can even get one on Amazon. The reason we're going into PCR is because it's kind of the gold standard for diagnostics. We can hopefully make it cheap, we can hopefully make it really scalable and really accessible so it can be implemented with relative ease. The process begins by isolating genetic material from the blood sample. Since Andy's target is RNA, the first step is converting it into DNA using an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. This enzyme assembles complementary base pairs and zips them up to produce a DNA sequence. Then the test goes through repeated cycles, each with these three key steps. First, you heat the sample to separate out the two strands. Then short DNA primers designed to match the beginning and end of the exact target sequence are added, along with three nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA, and a fluorescent tag that helps to track and quantify the DNA as it's copied. A DNA polymerase enzyme builds the new DNA strands starting from each primer, creating copies of the target sequence. After 30 to 40 cycles of this process, even a few copies of DNA can become billions, enough to detect and study. Using the fluorescent signal attached to each strand, we can now count how many copies are in the sample. But this wouldn't be breakthrough if the solve was quite that simple. Although qPCR works well for RNA and DNA, there is a huge fundamental problem with trying to do this for microRNA. Each microRNA is about 20 base pairs long, but so are the two primers and the probe molecule needed for qPCR. Historically, this tiny size meant that qPCR for microRNA was impossible. And here I appreciate, maybe frustratingly, in these episodes I'll have to touch on the secret source, parts of this story that I can hint at but can't fully explain publicly. They won't even tell me what's in the secret source. For Andy, it's exactly what he has done to the microRNA to make the PCR work that is his breakthrough. So we do target-specific extension where we extend out the microRNA because they're very homologous, they're very similar to each other. So we introduce site-specific adaptations that means that we can clearly distinguish between our on and off target. So now that we had an approach to detecting microRNA, we just needed to understand which microRNA in the body were most important when it came to predicting cancer. And to do that, Andy needed to test his approach on real data. Our test was trained on data from over or roughly around 21,000 patients across 12 different cancer types, including non-cancer. And I say non-cancer because many of those patients had other disease states. So what we did is we split all of those the, that sample data into three cohorts, training, test, and validation. Within the training cohort, we identified the 50 most predictive microRNAs using feature selection algorithms. And then we used a simple principal component analysis to see how well they separated out cancer from non-cancer. So if you look at the red, you'll see that this is cancer, and the blue, this is no cancer. Principal component analysis basically tries to explain multi-dimensional data using as few variables as possible. In this case, that's reducing the complexity of 50 microRNA dimensions down to just two. This is really helpful for human eyeballs and brains, but to truly get the full power from this data, you want to use the other 48. Because that can then pull apart those ones that are misclassified, like these ones here, for instance, because you have, you use all 50 dimensions, all 50 microRNAs, rather than trying to consolidate and simplify it down to just two, which is what we've done here. So moving out of 2D and back into 50D and applying that pattern recognition is exactly what AI and machine learning have gotten incredibly effective at doing over the past decade. By solving this multi-dimensional puzzle, the test doesn't just detect cancer, it can pinpoint exactly in the body where it's coming from. Uh, but obviously this is quite a rudimental approach, so we went one step further and created two machine learning models. One, a support vector machine to identify if cancer is present, yes or no, and then a neural network to identify if it is present, where it's located in the body. So these, uh, these four patients here are healthy. Uh, and they separate out quite nicely from these three, which are which have lung cancer, and this one, which has esophageal. So that using, I think it was eight of our microRNA targets, 
we can get good separation between what's healthy, what's lung, and what's esophageal. How Andy and his team are building this microRNA extension protocol and their machine learning models is the main focus of their work at the moment. That part might be years worth of further work, but this is where I think Andy and his team are becoming the best in the world at decoding this data. And the results so far are pretty astounding. We got sensitivity and specificity of 99% across all stages, and we got tumor site of origin accuracy of 96%. This was obviously in a case control population. So the next step is to do it in an asymptomatic population with follow-up data. Meaning that it finds almost everyone who has cancer while avoiding false positives in healthy people. Now, of course, as with any technology that moves from controlled lab conditions to the chaos of the real world, we expect the accuracy is going to drop with time. But the early data of this translation still looks really promising. True to their original goal, Andy and Xgenera are now moving into the real world. The NHS is now launching a new trial of a blood test that can detect bowel cancer and 11 other forms of the disease. The health secretary seems convinced he's giving £2.4 million in funding. And the impact goes beyond just saving lives. Early detection means less invasive, more effective treatments that could significantly ease the burden on health services. At the moment, the US spends $35 billion annually on cancer screenings. Widespread use of this test could save an estimated $11 billion by reducing late-stage treatments, unnecessary tests, and false positives. Andy understands the massive potential of this research and the responsibility that comes with it. So we want to make my own as kind of transparent as possible. We want to do everything that MHRA, FDA, EMA, everyone is happy with. We want to, we want to work towards a test that, you know, it has a clear design history that people are happy with that it's been developed in the right way. I do, I do love what I do. Um, but I think it's more that conceptually, I love the, the idea that we're making something that can genuinely have a positive impact. I think that is kind of why I smile through it. The reality is, is I've just had a baby. Uh, she's three months old. I'm not getting much sleep and I'm running a company and there are lots of other stresses as well going on. And it's like, there's a lot to do, but because I see that it could really have a big impact, it's like, okay, yeah, no, <laughs> deal with it, do it. <laughs> A lot of what we see in the headlines is just shiny surface level material. And I think it's really valuable to go deeper. Often the frustration we feel is that the big ideas just don't get anywhere, Fusion. But I think that is slowly changing, thanks to folk like Andy who realize that if you want a discovery to actually go somewhere, you might have to be the one that takes it there yourself. This is a series about pulling back that curtain and showing that these aren't stories just for an exclusive few. They're about real people making the leap from the lab bench into the real world. If that resonates with you, drop a comment and let me know if there are any stories that you'd like me to cover. Or if you're a scientist looking to get your idea out of the lab, I'll leave a link in the description down below where you can get in contact with me and my team. If you'd like to support what we're doing here, do consider joining the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.